Hello everyone, and welcome back to the History of Scotland, episode 20, The Fall of Macbeth and the Rise of Malcolm III. Quick shout out to the very nice comments I've received from Andy Bryan and Tom Lancaster. Really appreciate the kind words on the podcast you've sent through, and glad you're enjoying the story of Scotland's history. As mentioned last time, before we begin today's episode, we post updates for the podcast on Twitter. So please follow the history of SC1, that is the history of SC1 on Twitter, or you can find us by just typing in the history of Scotland on Twitter. I'm sure, pretty sure that will show up as well. We also have a Facebook group called the History of Scotland. If you wish to discuss the episodes with myself with feedback and comments, please head there as well. Anyhow, Last time, we took a look at Macbeth in fiction, mainly using the sources from Shakespeare himself and other plays and books creating depicting Macbeth. We learnt of the truth change to the stories being told from the chroniclers to Shakespeare, also learning what was the history behind the play creation and what were the themes told throughout the story. Macbeth, who was a great king, died in battle to Malcolm III. So, this week... We arrive in 1057 AD and we begin telling the rest of our great story of the history of Scotland. On the north side of the Mouth in 1057, after retreating with his men over the Connemouth Pass to take his last stand at the Battle of Lipifan, Macbeth stood wounded after battle with Malcolm Canmore, who would be the future Malcolm III, son of Duncan the First. The prophecy of Birchan, which is one of our sources in today's episodes, lets us know what happens next. Macbeth, whilst wounded, managed to travel 60 miles south, determined to make it through this and survive. His followers, some of the tribal leaders of Alba and the lords, followed him south. He arrived at Scon, but his condition worsened and soon he died of his injuries. His followers wept and began burial preparations. Macbeth ruled for 17 great years, and I really highly recommend you go back a few episodes to episode 18 to learn more about his amazing reign if you haven't done so already. Now, let's take a further step back and transition perspectives similar to Game of Thrones. Let's now go to Malcolm Canmore in his early life just as his father, Duncan I, is killed and Macbeth takes the throne. When Malcolm's world was turned upside down in 1040 AD, he sought safety in Northumberland in northern England. There he was looked after by Seward, Earl of Northumbria. Yes, the Seward who would later invade Scotland with him. He had his own ambitions to acquire territory in southern Scotland. By the time Malcolm reached maturity, he had acquired another even more powerful ally, the King of England, Edward, the Confessor. The English king saw an opportunity to restore a Dunkeld to the throne and make Malcolm his puppet ruler. Macbeth's Scottish kingdom was far from unified. Sutherland and Caffiness were still under Viking control. Another threat was the regular incursions in the north from Earl Thorin of Norkney. Malcolm's grandfather, Sirven, the late abbot of Dunkeld led an uprising against Macbeth in 1045 AD. Siran was defeated and killed, but Macbeth's problems were only delayed. The next year, the Earl of Northumberland led an army into Scotland and defeated Macbeth. Seward may have briefly grabbed control of Lothan and perhaps Strathclyde before Macbeth gathered a second army and drove Seward south. For now, the threat had been dealt with but Macbeth's enemies were prepared to bide their time. Malcolm would have to wait eight more years to get the better of Macbeth, and Macbeth carried on his rather glorious reign compared to his true tale. In 1054 AD, Edward the Confessor, Seward and Malcolm joined forces, and an English army again invaded southern Scotland. Macbeth was defeated at Dunson in Perthshire on the 27th of July of the same year, and so lost control of Perth and the thief. Then in 1057, Macbeth was fatally wounded in a skirmish at Lupapan, near modern-day Aberdeen, against a group of Malcolm's supporters. In 1057, Various chroniclers report the death of Macbeth at Malcolm's hand. Either way, Macbeth died, 
as we went through at the start of this episode, and he was succeeded on the 8th of September, 1057, by his stepson, Lulok, who was born in 1032 AD. But Malcolm disputed his right to reign. Malcolm controlled most of southern Scotland at this time, as well as Cumbria. Let's take a switch to Lulok's perspective quickly. Lulok was the son of Crook of Scotland from her first marriage to Gila Gottmacan, Mormor of Moray, and thus the stepson of Macbeth. Following the death of Macbeth at the battle on the 15th of August, 1057, the king's followers placed Luluk on the throne. He has the distinction of being the first king of Scotland, of whom there are coronation details available. He was crowned probably on the 8th of September, 1057, at the historical site of Scone, where his father supposedly died. Oh, his stepfather. Prior to this, he was married and had one daughter and one son. Lulok's son was Mormor of Moray, while still under the control of the Kingdom of Alba title by Lulok. Lulok didn't have the grit and prowess that his father Macbeth had. This appears to have made him look like a weak king, and he started to lose the support of the tribes, clans and nobles in Scotland. Malcolm began to gain so much more ground with Macbeth dead. The nobles, clans and tribes began to flock to his banner, and his right to kingship of Alba was becoming more of a reality. Determined to end this once and for all, he managed to hire some mercenaries and assassins and had Lulok murdered in an ambush in Strathbogue in the 17th of March, 1058 AD. Malcolm became king as Malcolm III of Scotland and the Dunkeeld line was restored with Duncan I avenged. If we switch back to Malcolm's reign just as he becomes king, the sources are scarce, but his one defining achievement was to better unify Scotland. As a historian D. Crouch here notes, Malcolm's handling of his collection of realms did more than anything else to define, in contemporary consensus, the Kingdom of Scotland out of Alba, Lothan, Galloway and Moray. And this is why we start to become associated Alba with Scotland and we start to replace the name of the Kingdom of Alba with the Kingdom of Scotland. It is for this reason that Malcolm became known as Malcolm Canmore from the Gaelic Seymour, meaning Great Head or Chief. The king was able to maintain a sizable infantry army through military service and to raise money from taxes. If an English chronicler and Benedict Monk is to be relied upon, who was one of our sources, at the time of Edward the Confessor, Malcolm was betrothed to the English king's kinsman, Margaret, and it is possible this happened when he visited England in 1059 AD. If a marriage agreement was made in 1059, it did not stop the Scots plundering Linda's farm in 1061. It was common practice in medieval Gaelic-speaking societies for kings to launch an invasion, the so-called Grecrig, or of a neighbour soon after taking power, and the Lindisfarne raid may have been used to boost the stability of the new regime. Because remember, Macbeth was popular with his people and with the chroniclers, so Malcolm III will need to prove his worth to his people. But, since the invasion affected directly only the territory of the rulers of Bambra, it is unlikely to have particularly bothered either King Edward or the Alderman of Northumbria in York, Tostig Godwinson, who at the time of pilgrimage to Rome, and who did not enjoy a good relationship with the Bambra fa family, became one of Malcolm's close confidants. Malcolm may have had a specific political motives in this though. For instance, it has been suggested that he may have been trying to advance the position of the Gospatric, his possible cousin at the expense of the ruling Edwulfian family. It has also been suggested that the raid may have been a part of a dispute about the status of Strathclyde. <laughs> A tradition in the 13th century Orkney saga related that Malcolm married the widow of Foreign Sigurdsson, the person who actually helped Macbeth come to the throne. This person died prior to Malcolm's marriage with Margaret. Malcolm may have also disregarded her when the opportunity to marry a higher status lady arose in 1068. The Orkney saga also claims that Duncan, later king, was a product of this union. Some medieval commenters following the William of Malmesbury claimed that Duncan was illegitimate, 
but this claim is propaganda reflecting the need of Malcolm's descendants by Margaret to undermine the claims of Duncan's descendants, the McWilliams. Similarly, however, the importance of McWilliams to the Earls of Orkney around 1200 AD would have provided an incentive to strengthen the historical ties between the two families, and thus the marriage to Malcolm may have been created for the purpose of fabricating common descent. The obituary of a certain Dominal, another son of Malcolm, is reported in 1085. Since Dominal has no recorded mother, he may have also been born to this person who was of noble birth, or else some other unrecorded woman in history. If historical Malcolm's marriage to her would have helped create a favourable political position in the North and West, then explains why the marriage potentially happened before Margaret. One of the sagas tells that her father, Finn, had been an advisor to Harold Hardrada, and after a falling out with Harold, when they made an earl by C. Swain Estridson, king of Denmark, may have been another recommendation for the match. Malcolm appears to have enjoyed a peaceful relationship with the earldom of Orkney, ruled jointly by his possible stepsons, Paul and Ilrid Thorinson. The Orkney saga reports strife with Norway, but this may be misplaced as it associates this with Magnus Barefoot, who became king of Norway only in 1093 AD, the year of Malcolm's death. On the other side of the country, on the 3rd of October 1065, the Thanes of York and the rest of Yorkshire descended on York, where Tostig Godwinson was and they occupied the city. They killed Tostig's officials then declared Tostwig outlawed for his unlawful actions and sent Morcor, younger brother of Edwin, Earl of Mercia. The northern rebels marched south to press their case with King Edward. They were joined at Northampton by Earl Edwin and his forces. There they were met by Earl Harold, who had been sent by King Edward to negotiate with them and thus did not bring his forces. After Harold, by then the king's right-hand man, had spoken with rebels at Northampton, he likely realised that Tostig would not be able to retain Northumbria. When he returned to Oxford, where the royal council was to meet on the 28th of October, he had probably already made up his mind. Harold Godwinson persuaded King Edward the Confessor to agree to the demands of the rebels. Tostig was outlawed a short time later, possibly early in November, because he refused to accept his deposition as commanded by Edward. This led to the fateful confrontation between the two Godwinsons. At a meeting of the king and his council, Tostig publicly accused Harold of fomenting the rebellion. Harold was keen to unify England in the face of a grave threat from William of Normandy, who had openly declared his intention to take the English throne. It was likely that Harold had exiled his brother to ensure peace and loyalty in the north. Tostig, however, remained unconvinced and plotted vengeance. Tostig took a ship with his family and some loyal thanes and took refuge with his brother-in-law, Baldwin V, Count of Flanders. He then travelled to Normandy and attempted to form an alliance with William, who was related to his wife. Baldwin provided him with a fleet and he landed in the Isle of Wight in May 1066 AD, where he collected money and provisions. He raided the coast as far as Sandwich, but was forced to retreat when King Harold called out land and naval forces. He moved north, and after an unsuccessful attempt to get his brother to join him, he raided Norfolk and Lincolnshire. The earls Edwin and Morcar defeated him decisively. Deserted by his men, left alone, he fled to his sworn brother, King Malcolm III of Scotland, due to their earlier alliance. Tostig spent the summer of 1066 in Scotland in the court of Malcolm as they feasted, partied and discussed the ongoing problems in England at this time. He then made contact with King Harold III Hardrada of Norway and persuaded him to invade England. One of the sagas claims that he sailed for Norway and greatly impressed the Norwegian king and his court, managing to sway a decidedly unenthusiastic Hardrada who just concluded a long and inconclusive war with Denmark into raising a levy to take the throne of England. Tostig left Scotland, said his goodbyes to Malcolm, kissed and embraced and then united with Harold Hardrada down south and then began invading the north of England around York, winning their first battle. 
Harold raised an army and headed north, catching the main army by surprise as we know, and defeating Tostig and Haldrada on September the 25th, 1066, at the Battle of Stamford Bridge. However, little did he know, Harold, that he would soon face an even greater threat. Now, 1066, and all this I've just been going over with Tostig's life, why are we going through this? This year has echoed throughout the ages, and is one of those years most people know of history of. Let's take a quick look at the surrounding summary of what happened as even this war of succession in England, it affected all of Britain, it affected the new kingdom of Scotland, and it affected Malcolm as he had a vested interest on the outcome. Following the death of the childless English king, King Edward the Confessor in January of 1066, there were many questions as to who would rule next. Edward had married the only daughter, Edith of Godwin of Wessex, the most powerful family in England at the time. Having no heirs to claim his crown, the dying Edward declared Edith's brother, Harold Godwinson, the powerful Earl of Wessex, his successor, and he became King Harold II of England. However, this hasty handover was problematic for several men with aspirations to the English throne. William, Duke of Normandy, eventually known as William the Conqueror, perhaps felt the most cheated of it all, especially considering that King Edward had already promised him the throne in 1051. William, a distant cousin of Edward's, asserted his right to the crown based both on his relationship to the former king as well as the verbal contract between them. With Harold II trying to recuperate from his runnings with Tostig and Hardrada around York, William landed at Pevensey, England on September 28, 1066 and took the city. After securing this area, William marched onwards towards Hastings to regroup his men and it was there that William and Harold would settle their differences. On Senlac Hill, about seven miles outside Hastings, William and Hardrada's forces clashed on October the 14th, 1066. William, known as the Conqueror, this onwards, led his winning combination of Norman infantry, cavalry and archers against Harold's poorly trained Anglo-Saxon peasants with a total show of force running between 5,000 and 7,000 men. By the day's end, King Harold II had been reportedly shot through the eye with an arrow, allowing William to claim victory and Norman control of England. Malcolm appears to have offered indirect support to the ill-fated invasion of England by Harold Hardrada and Tostig in 1066, which ended in defeat and death at the Battle of Stamford Bridge. In 1068, he granted asylum to a group of English exiles fleeing from William of Normandy. Among them, Agatha, widow of Edward the Confessor's nephew, Edward the Exile, and her children, Edgar Atheling and her sisters, Margaret and Christina. And yes, it's that Margaret, the famous saint of Scotland. They were accompanied by Gospratric, by this time Earl of Bamborough. The exiles were to be disappointed, however, if they had expected an immediate assistance from Malcolm and Scotland. In 1069, the exiles returned to England to join a spreading revolt in the north. Even though the Earl of Northumberland and Sidward's son submitted by the end of the year, the arrival of a Danish army under Swain Estridson seemed to ensure that William's position remained weak. Malcolm decided on war and took his army south into Cumbria across the Pennines, wasting Teesdale and Cleveland, then marching north, loaded with loot, to Wearmouth. There, Malcolm met Edgar and his family, who were invited to return with him, but did not. As Swain had by now been bought off with a large Dane gold, Malcolm took his army home. Against the backdrop of William's scorched earth policy against the northern English rebels, William sent the Earl to raid Scotland through Cumbria as a further act of reprisal, and it's the same Earl of Northumbria that actually teamed up with Malcolm in his early years. In return, the Scots fleet raided the Northumbrian coast, where the Earl's possessions were concentrated. Late in the year, perhaps shipwrecked on their way to the European exile, Edgar and his family again arrived in Scotland, this time to remain until their death. By the end of 1070, Malcolm had married Edgar's sister, Margaret, later known as Saint Margaret. The naming of their children represented a break with the traditional Scots regal names such as Malcolm, Synod and Aed. 
The point of naming Margaret's sons Edward after her father Edward the Exile, Edmund after her grandfather Edmund Ironside, Ethelred for her great grandfather Ethelred the Unready, and Edgar for her great grandfather Edgar and her brother, briefly the elected king Edgar Ethelin, was unlikely to be missed in England, where William of Normandy's grasp on power was far from secure. Whether the adoption of the classical Alexander for the future Alexander I of Scotland, either for Pope Alexander II or for Alexander the Great, and the biblical names of David for the future David I of Scotland represented a recognition that William of Normandy would not be easily removed, or was due to the repetition of Anglo-Saxon royal names, another Edmund had preceded Edgar is not known. Margaret also gave Malcolm two daughters, Edith, who married Henry I of England, and Mary, who married Eustace II of Boulogne. In 1072 AD, with the harrowing of the north completed and his position again secure, William of Normandy came north with an army and a fleet. Malcolm met William in the south of Scotland, and in the words of the Anglo-Saxon chronicle, became his man, and handed over his eldest son Duncan as a hostage, and arranged peace between William and Edgar. Accepting the overlordship of the King of the English was no novelty, as the previous kings had done so without result. The same was true of Malcolm. His agreement with the English king was followed by further raids into Northumbria, which led to further trouble in the earldom and the killing of Bishop William Walcher at Gateshead. In 1080, William sent his son, Robert Curtos, the famous crusader, north with an army, while his brother, Odo, punished the Northumbrians. Malcolm, seeing the light, again made peace, and this time kept it for over a decade. Malcolm faced little recorded internal opposition throughout this time, with the exception of Lulloch's son, Macbeth's stepson, in an unusual entry for the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, contains little on Scotland, it says that in 1078, Malcolm seized, seized the mother of Lulloch's son and all of his treasures and his cattle and the son of Macbeth's stepson himself. But then he began to escape with difficulty but managed to get away. Whatever provoked this strife, Lulloch's son survived until 1085 AD when he perished. A man forgotten to history but one, if the battle between Macbeth and Malcolm went any different, may have been more known to us. So, let's leave Malcolm III there. Next week, I want us to go over one of Scotland's greatest saints, St. Margaret of Scotland. Learning of her life from being born in the Kingdom of Hungary to the English Prince Edward the Exile, son of Edwin Ironside, learning how Margaret and her family returned to England in 1057. Then, following the death of King Carol II at the Battle of Hastings in 1066, her brother Edgar Atheling was elected as King of England, but was never crowned as we know. So I want to go over how she and her family fled north, how Margaret married our King Malcolm III of Scotland by the end of 1070, and then I want to discuss how she became a saint, and the lasting impact she had on Scotland as one of Scotland's finest queens. After that, we'll be learning of Malcolm III's relationship with William, the, William Rufus and his change around court, changing courtly life, changing the structure of Scotland and making it more of an Anglo-Norman structure than what it once was. I am really happy to be staying with Malcolm for a few more episodes. In total, I think we've got about three more left with him, so we're going to be delving into many of his details from his wife to his structure ruling his history with William Rufus and the wars with England. But let's leave that there. Thank you again to everyone for the continued support on the series. If you have a time, please do follow our Twitter at the History of SC1 or type in the History of Scotland on Twitter. And as I said, we also have a Facebook group called The History of Scotland. If you wish to discuss the episodes with myself, with feedback and comments, head there. As always, any other corrections or issues with the podcast, you can also let me know at History of Scotland Podcast at gmail.com. That is History of Scotland Podcast at gmail.com. Please also, if you have the time, leave a review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. And we're also available on Podbean, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, and many other great podcasting sites. Other than that, the next podcast will be next week on time and as scheduled. So until then, stay safe, have a great week, and I'll catch you all on the next one. Peace.